Welcome, Greg. Welcome to uh, this awesome podcast. We're so excited to have you on. Well, I've been I've been preparing for this moment for days. For days. We would hope so. Yeah. yeah. It, it's a big thing <laughs> it's, now. It is. It's huge. But, you know, we want to talk about you. We want to talk about Teradyne. We want to talk about what is happening in the industry. So to the audience out here, what's Teradyne? Or who is Teradyne? Teradyne is a 60-year-old company. Um, for 55 of those years, we built we built things that tested other things. So we were the the company that essentially invented the testers for semiconductor devices, and we've grown with that industry. So uh, we're about a three and a half billion dollar company. Um, and in 2015, uh, we got into the automation business when we bought Universal Robots. And the reason we did that was that uh, even though test is a great business and we make good money, uh, we didn't see the opportunity for sort of another 60 years of growth <laughs> out of that space. And when we looked around, um, we were looking for something that would that we'd be good at, you know, yeah. that uh, would uh, benefit from, uh, you know, knowing how to put complicated things into, into manufacturing environments and have them run reliably. Um, and, uh, and an industry where uh, a company with a global presence would help other companies grow faster. And when we looked at automation, we saw that there was all this, all of this innovation going on that was sort of disrupting the way automation had been. Um, these small companies that were coming in with good ideas, uh, leveraging compute power, AI, other things to try and, try and um, do automation in a different way. And we thought that the combination of sort of our global scale and those new ideas, we could really make something of that when you combine that with the fact that there aren't as many people to be in jobs <laughs> anymore. You know, yeah. like if you look at the statistics, um, right now we're at the point where it's like the, the smallest portion of total global population is of working age. And it's going to get worse over the next 10 mm -hmm. years. So more and more people are going to be trying to produce all of the goods that the world needs for a larger world population. And we thought that was a pretty good fundamental for to get into a business. Absolutely. One of your quotes that you took away was, we want people to work with robots, not work like robots. How is that? That was such a great takeaway. Oh, I stole that from the UR folks, by the way. They, they, <laughs> they came up with that. They, I mean, so how does well, that speak to the brands, though, that, that we're looking at? I mean, here, Universal yeah. Robotics, Mobile Industrial Robot. I, I immediately think of those, I think, flexibility, collaborative mm -hmm. design, working alongside people, and not the idea of trying to take people out of the equation. So there's the, the thing is we are um, we're kind of like the ultimate brownfield um, automation company. Right. So we are not if if you are going to invent a lights out factory, we're not the we're not the people you should work with. You know, if you're in logistics, you should go to auto store. And if you're you know, if you're building cars, you should go to Fanuc and, and, and get a line builder and design it with no people in the process whatsoever. But if you have a factory and you want to introduce automation in a gradual way then you need robots that are going to be able to work around people. And you're going to be able to, you're going to need to be able to introduce that in a way that your workforce can support. And that's true for both the UR and for AMRs, that the sort of the fundamental thing is they need to be able to work safely in an environment where people are going to be around. And it makes it a lot more complicated. <laughs> it's, a, it's, a, it's a much more complex world when you start introducing people to it. Um, but we think that the, uh, the opportunity for us is really there. Absolutely. So one more thing real quick. Small to medium sized manufacturers represent 96 to 97 percent of the companies here in the United States is those mm -hmm. small to medium sized businesses. A lot of those businesses view automation as a high risk because they view it as a high integration, a high cost. Yep. How has that changed? Not necessarily specific to UR or to Mir, but just in general in the industry. How is that changing moving forward? You know, it's a it's a great question because um, have, have either of you read the Lean Startup parts of it? Eric I, have, I need to get all the way through it. It's on my shelf. You know, actually, it's one of those business books that if you read the first half, you can stop. Okay. Um, all right. Good to know. Good to know. I had a roommate in San Francisco give it to me. That's where I acquired that. <laughs> but the, uh, the, the, the thing that's really cool about that is they say that one of the keys um, to, to finding product market fit is – you actually study the customers that are most successful. You know, so if you have some customers that are taking the journey that you think all of your customers should take, look at them. So, I, so there are a lot of SMEs that 
are leveraging especially universal robot stuff um, really successfully. And, but it's not general. It's not generalized. And so we're trying to figure out what's different about the ones that succeed. And the key that we see is the ones that succeed, um, they go into it knowing that it's not, it's not as simple as an iPhone. You know, that like a, a lot of the way that people have pitched this stuff is it's, oh, it's a robot. It's so simple. You just set it up and it goes. And there's a salesman that comes in that knows the product in and out. And he like sets something up in 15 minutes. And then he walks out the door and the customer's like, what the hell do I do now? Yeah. Um, so even though it's easy to program and even though the safety features are sort of built into the point where you're unlikely to hurt yourself with the product, you still need to know how to mount it so it doesn't shake. You still need to know how to set up a work cell so that you can pick things up and put them down in the right place. You need to be able to pick the right end effector. And all of that is skill. You know, that's stuff that people need to learn. And the, the small and medium-sized businesses that we see that are successful with that either have an owner or an employee that gets into it. That's like, oh, this is, this is something that I can learn. And they learn it. And they, and, and they discover that the, the key isn't really like, oh, I can, I can replace people. It's more like I can get the same number of people to cover two shifts. Or I can get an extra, you know, I can get extra lights out time on these machine tools. And, you know, so it's, the thing that it's, it's hard is, when we start comparing ourselves to other like consumer technologies, the geometric growth rates can get really, really high, really, really fast. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But when you're talking about SMEs, like the whole distribution system to SMEs, the whole, it's, it's not a fast moving industry. Yeah. And if you look at how long it took like CNC machine tools to come in or laser cutting to come in, it's like a 10, 20 year process. But the, but the total potential is huge. Yeah. So, like, we're, we're growing 40% per year. And That's my incredible. boss is like, why can't you grow more? Um, and it's a great question. Because it's like, the, like we, we think there's like a $200 billion potential market for collaborative um, articulated robots and another $200, million for, $200 billion for AMRs. Mm -hmm. And if you look at total sales in both of those markets, it's below 3%. Like, we've satisfied less than 3% of that whole thing so far. So any board of directors is going to be like, well, when are you going to get the other $197 mm -hmm. billion? Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, but there are so many little problems to solve in different parts of that market to open that up that I think we'll be at it for a long time. And I think we'll have to be satisfied with only 40% growth until... <laughs> Yeah. Until we sort of, un until you turn but, the magic key. Absolutely. The, their worst problems to have. We're here at the A3 Business Forum. We're kicking off the year. Why are you excited about automation going into 2022 and beyond? I think I have the advantage of uh, not having the kind of history in automation that most of the people at this conference have. Mm -hmm. And and so I can be the irrational optimist. You know, I've, nice. I've not been through my first automation downturn. And... I um, and I've been like busy drinking my own Kool Aid for the last year yeah. in terms of the potential <laughs> in the market. Um, I know that there are going to be bumps, but the 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 basic the basic story that there are going to be fewer people to fill manufacturing jobs is kind of incontrovertible. Mm -hmm. yeah. And mm -hmm. the fact that outsourcing as a strategy has kind of is at the end. Is what was kind the of a statistic thing. you said today earlier? Oh, so in 2020, I was like desperately Googling yesterday, trying yeah. to find something interesting to say. Um, and yeah, so in 2020, 54% um, of the companies, in, manufacturing companies in America were considering reshoring. And they repeated the survey oh, in 2021. Yeah. And it's 83%. It was a, bi now. It was a yeah. big change. Incredible. Quick change. Not a surprise. No, well, really I'm, not. I'm, yeah. But it's, it's also one of those surveys that's about intentions. Yeah. yeah, you know, so what are the actions? Like, when are they going to spend the money? So when we look at our sales numbers, we definitely see a slightly stronger uptick in high wage regions than in low wage regions, but both of them have been growing a lot. So it's not like we can say, oh, there's definitely a trend where manufacturing is coming back home. It's all anecdotes. But I'm we're we're really excited about that. And and like the other thing that I think is cool is. Um, 
I don't know if you're if if you're into sustainability or anything, but the idea of like cutting ten thousand miles out of a supply chain in terms of transport costs huge. There's actually like a carbon foot impact impact of that, and you know, I. I know some people who care about that from an environmental perspective, and I know some other people that care that containers cost 740% more than they used to. Mm-hmm. Kind of so, a win-win, really. Yeah. <laughs> so it, 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 it kind of transcends politics at that yeah. point. Excellent. Well, you've been listening to Manufacturing Happy Hour at A3, home of irrational optimism. Yes. Let's say that. <laughs> so we appreciate you jumping on today's show. Awesome. Thank Great. you. <laughs>